birthday house. Let's all stand for opening song. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the glory of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He hath loosed the faithful lightning of his terrible sword. His truth is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Christ was born across the sea with the glory of 
Colossians chapter 4. Headline is called Further Instructions, something that we can all strive to uh, emulate Paul. Beginning in chapter 2, we'll go through verse 6. Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And pray for us too that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Be wise in the way that you act toward outsiders. Make most of every opportunity. Let your conversation always be full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. In your 
celebration of our freedoms uh, it's always in a, a special day uh, when we think back to the founding of our country and uh, it's always an easy easy day to do uh, community meditation because of, of what goes on but um, I want to read a little article to you it talks about what happened to the signers of the Declaration of Independence have you ever wondered what happened to the 56 men who signed the Declaration of Independence? Five signers were captured by the British as traitors and tortured before they died. Twelve had their homes ransacked and burned. Two lost their sons in the Revolutionary Army. Another had two sons captured. Nine of the 56 fought and died from wounds or hardships of the Revolutionary War. They signed and they pledged their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor. What kind of men were they? 24 were lawyers and jurists. And all I can say is that the profession of being a lawyer has changed over time. 11 were merchants, 9 were farmers and large plantation owners. Men of means, well educated. But they signed the Declaration of Independence knowing full well that the penalty would be death if they were captured. Carter Braxton of Virginia, a wealthy planter and trader, saw his ship swept from the seas by the British Navy. He sold his home and properties to pay his debts and died in rags. Thomas McKern was so hounded by the British that he was forced to move his family almost constantly. He served in the Congress without pay and his family was kept in hiding. His possessions were taken from him and poverty was his reward. Vandals or soldiers, or both, looted the properties of Ellery, Clymer, Hall, Walton, Gwinnett, Hayward, Rutledge, and Middleton. At the Battle of Yorktown, Thomas Nelson Jr. noted that the British General Cornwallis had taken over the Nelson home for his headquarters. The owner quietly urged General George Washington to open fire. The home was destroyed and Nelson died bankrupt. Francis Lewis had his home and properties destroyed. The enemy jailed his wife and she died within a few months. John Hart was driven from his wife's bedside as she was dying. Their 13 children fled for their lives. His fields and gristmill were laid to waste. For more than a year, he lived in forests and caves, 
returning home to find his wife dead and his children vanished. A few weeks later, he died from exhaustion and a broken heart. Norris and Livingston suffered similar fates. Such were the stories and sacrifices of the American Revolution. These were not wild-eyed, rabble-rousing ruffians. They were soft-spoken men of means and education. They had security, but they valued liberty more. Standing tall, straight, and unwavering, they pledged for the support of this declaration with firm reliance on the protection of the divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. And while, yes, the 4th of July is a time of celebration, it's also time to realize that there were men that sacrificed greatly so that we can live in the country that we have. We value our freedom, we value our liberty, and we hold these men in high esteem who are willing to risk it all and indeed lose it all for the beginning and foundings of our country. And it's, it's, it's rightful and I think it's correct for us to celebrate that day, the July, of July 4th is the founding of our, our country. And we do it once a year and, and we, we have a great celebration during that one time a year. But keep in mind that was for our freedom here on earth. There was another gentleman who died, suffered a terrific loss, was dedicated to his cause, suffered greatly on this earth, and he did it for you and, and me so that we could have not just liberty here on earth, but we could have liberty forever and that freedom from sin and spend eternity with him. I'm going to read just a quick passage we, as we value um, liberty so much and our, our independence. Listen to what Paul has to say in Romans chapter 6, verse 15 through 18. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? By no means. Don't you know that when you offer yourself to someone to obey him as slaves, you are slaves to the one you obey? Whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you wholeheartedly obeyed the form of teaching to which you were entrusted. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. So I think it's interesting as we talk about freedom uh, during this time of year and celebrating the fourth, we received our freedom here on this earth. We received our freedom from the, the British to live our lives as we want, to determine our own destiny. But we were also slaves of somebody else. We were also indebted to someone else, someone who was not for us, and that was Satan also. So we were slaves to him when we were still in our sinful, sinful nature. But you look here in verse 18, Paul says, we've been set free from that slave, from being slave to him, being enslaved to sin. And now we have voluntarily, I will add, become slaves to righteousness. When we made the decision to follow Christ, we voluntarily said we will be slaves to God, we will be slaves to righteousness, and that's what will control our lives. It's not always easy, but that's our decision that we've, we've made. And so while we celebrate the 4th of July once a year for our freedom we have on this earth, I think it's fitting that we celebrate our freedom from sin weekly. I don't know about you, from time to time I need that reminder weekly that I am free from sin. I've made that decision to follow God and to become that slave to righteousness. And we all are able to do that because of what Christ did for us on the cross. And so we have the communion. If it's in the back, you haven't received one yet, please, uh, you can go to the back and get one. But this time we're going to partake. The loaf representing his body, and the cup representing his blood. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we are, are so thankful, Father, for the, the men and women who were able and willing to stand for, for right in this country, Father, that was its founding, Father, that had its moral precepts based on, on your teachings. 
And Father, we were so thankful that they were able to stand firm and that they were victorious. And Father, during this time, we, we remember, at uh, this time of year, we remember those people who have, have served our country and suffered and, and died uh, from our beginning, from our founding. And Father, we're thankful for them also. But Father, even more profound is the, the sacrifice that your son uh, did for us. Father, that he went to the cross on our behalf. He took all of our sin on his shoulders and it was nailed to the cross with him. And Father, he did it out of love. He did it as out of the mercy in him to allow us to be spend eternity with you. Father, that we will um, trust and obey in what he says that we can spend eternity with, with you. So Father, as we partake now, let us remember that sacrifice. Let us remember that our, our freedom in Christ it's also our desire to become slaves to righteousness. And Father, it's all because of Christ. It's in his name I pray. Amen. Rest for thee, I sigh, when will the moment come, when I shall lay this armor by and dwell in peace at home. We'll work till Jesus comes, we'll work till Jesus comes, we'll work till Jesus comes and we'll be gathered home. There are burdens here we all must bear with trouble pressing so there will be no sorrow over there on heaven's peaceful shore we'll work till jesus comes we'll work till jesus comes we'll work till jesus comes and There is work on earth for me and you according to God's word. And whatsoever work we do should be done as to the Lord. We'll work, we'll work till, till Jesus comes. comes. We'll, work we'll work till Jesus comes. We'll work, we'll work till Jesus comes and we'll be gathered home. Will you work till Jesus comes? Will you work till Jesus comes? Will you work till Jesus comes and we'll all be gathered into our uh, prayer time uh, let me share with you what uh, was brought up at Sunday school um, of course our country needs prayers in time of uh, turmoil and strife that we have uh, these prayers for uh, healing uh, for relationships and uh, 
not just in the country, but also uh, uh, within the church. Uh, we uh, also remembered uh, Jerry's family and the uh, service uh, that will be taking place uh, at 3 o'clock uh, today at Casey Jones Park in Elizabeth. And uh, Rebecca shared with uh, one of her friends, her husband Scott, um, is very sick with the COVID and is in the emergency or in uh, ICU. Um, is there anything else that uh, we need to, to bring before God at this time? Let us pray. Father in heaven, we come to you with our concerns and our petitions. Father, because we do have nowhere else to turn. Father, as our, our God and our loving Father, you are uh, intimately aware of our concerns and our problems. And Father, that's why we, we turn to you, because you can have a great impact. So, Father, we lift up our country and the turmoil and the strife that we're going through. We just pray for a peace and understanding to permeate all people. Uh, Father, that uh, we can, can follow what's best for the country and follow what your, your guidelines and, and precepts and rules are for, for living. Father, we pray for healing. Uh, there's a time of, of strife also within the church. Uh, but people that, um, that need that healing, Father, who have been hurt. And we just pray for, for understanding and that comfort and peace that can only come from you. Father, help those who are hurting to, to seek out uh, people who can, can help them, Father. And that's uh, what we're here to do is to help each other. And just pray that they will, will do that. We pray for... Rebecca's friend, uh, Lisa's husband, Scott, who's ill with the coronavirus. Father, you are the great physician. We just pray for your hand to, to touch Scott and that, uh, that he will uh, be able to return home uh, to Lisa. And Father, we lift up uh, the service this afternoon for uh, Jerry Weichel, a dear friend of ours here. Father, particularly for his, his kids and uh, his grandkids, his family, we know it'll be a difficult day. And we just pray for uh, a peace for a comfort that only you can provide to them. And Father, we're so thankful for the willingness of the church body here to step up and help in any way possible. And Father, may we continue to reflect the, the light that shines from your son. Father, I pray you'll be with uh, our brother Crabtree as he brings our message again. Father, that it will, uh, will be meaningful to us, Father, that it will draw us closer to you and that we can take that that love that we receive and, and pass it on to others. In the name of Christ, I pray. Amen. So, Mr. Crabtree is here again, um, and I'm sure you're all excited about that. I thought he did a great job last last week, and uh, we're excited to have him again. And uh, we will turn it over in, and if I'm able to get around like that when I'm 90, 92, I will feel really, really, really well. So, congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. Well, it's good to be back with you again today. When I visit a church, I uh, cannot help making some judgments about the congregation. Uh, I don't try to be just judgmental. I just try to assess what kind of a church it is. And... Uh, I think two things I've noticed here already. One of the first thing is that uh, you folks know your scripture. It was evident in the Bible school class, the Sunday school class that I attended. And um, as I mentioned last week, I am part of the Academy Christian Church in Colorado Springs. We, before the virus, we were running about 1,200 in our weekly attendance. And I teach in EBF there. We don't have Sunday school classes anymore. We have ABFs, Adult Bible Fellowships, which I still insist on calling Sunday school classes. But uh, uh, I, I don't think that the people in my ABF uh, would know as much scripture as was evident in the class that I attended this morning. I congratulate you on your biblical knowledge. And I think one other thing is evident. I think you have good, strong leadership here and I am certain that they will carry you through this time uh, when you're looking for a new minister to lead and serve this congregation. 
Well, it's always a problem to know what to preach when you come to a church you don't know. When I uh, have preached at the, the Academy Christian Church, I, I kind of know what they needed, or at least what I thought they needed, so I uh, knew what to preach. It's hard to when you go to a congregation you don't know. But today I want to talk about the church because that's always a good topic. Uh, as Dallas mentioned, when it, it was 92 years ago that uh, when I, at that time, two weeks old, was carried into the uh, little Church of Christ in Allentown, Ohio. Uh, Allentown was a small town just out of Wheelersburg, which was just out of Scioteville, which was just out of New Boston, which was just out of Portsmouth, Ohio. Um, I attended the church there until I was six years of old, six years old, and then my family moved to Prescott, Arizona in the middle of the Great Depression. Uh, I came back to that church later as a student minister. My grandmother, who was a wonderful saintly follower of Jesus Christ, was a member of that congregation. She lived to be 96, by the way. My uncle was one of the elders there, so I ended up as minister of this church in which I grew up. I was currently, at that time, a student at what was then the Cincinnati Bible Seminary, which later became Cincinnati Christian University. And I say this very regretfully, it closed down last year. It's sad because the seminary or the university uh, sent more men and women into ministry and mission ministry than any other one of our institutions. It was my alma mater and I, I miss it. But at any rate, I came back to the Allentown Church of Christ. And by the way, in the East, uh, many Christian churches bear the name Church of Christ. They're just like Elbert Christian Church, uh, but they use the term Church of Christ. There are also the a cappella Churches of Christ, Churches of Christ that do not use musical instruments. But this was the Allentown Church of Christ, and I was the minister there then, a student minister. And it was a humbling experience. And one of the things that humbled me was the fact that they insisted on calling me Dickie Crabtree. Uh, this is our minister, Dickie Crabtree. Well, I felt that was a little demeaning. After all, I was studying very important subjects like, like apologetics and hermeneutics and exegesis and Greek and Roman and Greek and Hebrew, and I thought I deserved a little more respect than that. But if I began to become a little too important, the older ladies of the church could deflate my ego by simply saying, don't get uppity with me. I used to change your diaper. Uh, that's rather humiliating, So, but I enjoyed the experience there. Um, so I've been in the church all my life. In fact, uh, I haven't missed many Sundays in those 92 years. I can't remember a time when I didn't know about God, know about Jesus, and did not believe in God and believe in Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I um, grew up in a family, like many of yours, I hope, where the church was the center of our lives. For most of those years, my father worked in a Ford garage. My mother was a stay-at-home mom. And I appreciate the Christian upbringing, upbringing uh, that was so much a part of my life. And I greatly admire uh, those who have homes like that. They're kind of disappearing, uh, but I uh, hope that we can preserve them uh, in much of our community. Uh, I also admire people uh, who come into the church later in life. I just grew up with the church from the time, as I say, I was a tiny baby. And I admire those people who come to faith in Christ later and I sometimes wonder if I would have had a greater appreciation of the church if I had discovered the grace of God and the love of God at a later point in my life. 
I have seen many people who were not Christians for a significant part of their lives who came to Christ and it was such an exhilarating, such a liberating experience that I kind of feel in a way I miss that. I want to say this about the church. The church is remarkable. It started with just a handful of followers of Jesus Christ who was something of an itinerant rabbi. It faced the opposition and persecution of the greatest ch church, or the greatest empire, rather, in the history of the world. And it not only survived that persecution, it conquered, it won. In the year 313, the church was granted the protection of the empire, and Constantine I became the first uh, Christian emperor of the Roman Empire. And through the church, through the years, the church has faced opposition, but it still lives on. That church provides guidance and stability for millions and millions of people. It's been a source of hope and encouragement for more than 20 centuries. The church has blessed marriages. It's cared for the poor, the needy, the orphans, the widows. And more than that, it has carried the gospel of Jesus Christ as we seek to redeem this world for his kingdom. But what is more significant about the church is the fact that Christ loves the church. In Ephesians, the fifth chapter and the 25th verse, the apostle Paul writes, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. So many times we use that scripture to help us to understand something about the relationships that should be in the family. But I think it's very significant here that we find the statement that Christ loved the church and he gave himself for it. This church is also described, it's described as the bride of Christ, and it's also described as the body of Christ. In Ephesians, the fourth chapter, beginning with the 11th verse, we read, it was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers, to prepare God's people for works of service, so that the body of Christ might be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of God. There, then we will no longer be infants tossed about by, and by, back and forth by the waves, blown here and there by every wind of teaching or by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will be in all things grow up to him who is the head, that is Christ, from whom the whole body, and that's the church, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. So the relationship between Christ and the church is as close and intimate as the relationship of your head to the body. We are the body of Christ, and he is the head of the church. I'm convinced that we're going through a difficult time in many ways for the church today. Uh, I'm concerned about some of the things that I hear and read, and things that you hear and read too, I'm sure. Um, Studies have shown that a growing number of people uh, who consider themselves spiritual or even Christian uh, have little interest in the church. Uh, this is especially true of our young people from about age 18 to age 30. It's a sad thing that when many of our young people leave to go to college or to go into some profession, or occupation, many of them, many of them, leave the church at that time. It reminds you of the 1960s, 
which was another bad time for the church. And the Jesus movement that was popular then with young people saying, Jesus, yes, the church, no. Well, I'm not at all certain that that's okay with Christ. Remember that the church is the bride of Christ. And Christ loves his bride. In fact, it says he died for her. And I think that you're saying, he's saying, if you really love me, you're going to love my bride also. Yet, uh, they say, but the church is so imperfect. And it is. I would have to admit that there may be some churches that are pretty dreadful. And it may be that some of you here have been hurt at some time by a church. And sometimes people disappoint us in churches. Sometimes people hurt us. Sometimes people fail us. Some cynic has said that the church is like Noah's Ark. If it weren't for the storm outside, you couldn't stand the smell inside. Well, I, I think that's too harsh. Um, I see the church doing all kinds of good ministries in the community and around the world. Uh, I'd like, like to look at missions like AIDS, the International Disaster Emergency Service, that goes all over the world caring for people when they have floods or earthquakes or other disasters. Uh, for many years, I've been on the Board of Fame, which is a medical mission, and I really enjoy what they're doing. They're building hospitals and clinics around the world, and they're bringing medicine to people who otherwise would die without it. It's estimated that fame ministries alone around the world take care of one million people a year. That's a ministry of the church, and I appreciate what's being done. I um, appreciate the fact that at Academy Christian, we're very much involved in ministering to Bangladesh which used to be called Burma. Uh, we are working with a missionary there, a missionary family there. Uh, we um, help their school, we help their orphanage. Recently, a group from our church went over, led by Dr. Joyce Michael, one of our medical doctors, and they took care of the children there and presented programs for them. It's great, Bangladesh is one of the poorest countries in the world, and I'm glad that we can be involved there. And I know that you're involved in missions. I don't know what, and I don't know how much, but I know that you're involved, and I know that that's a part of what God intends for his church. I can say, I love the church. And second, I want to say, I love the Christian church. By that, I mean churches like Elbert Christian Church, or churches like Academy Christian Church or churches like First Christian in Inglewood, where I grew up as a high school student. Uh, these are generally known as Christian churches, or churches of Christ. Now, I grew up in the Christian church, but it's interesting, probably many of you did here as well. You may have grown up in this church or in a church like it. Academy Christian is quite different. We have a majority, a large majority, of people there who did not grow up in Christian churches. And I think it's one of the tributes to the restoration movement and to Christian churches that people from all different backgrounds can come together on the basis of faith in Jesus Christ, obedience to him in Christian baptism, and to seeking to embody in our lives the life of Jesus Christ. So, uh, Today, I want to take just a moment to kind of review some of that history. It may be old to you. It may be new to some. Uh, but um, you may realize that in the centuries after the New Testament church, well, about the time of the third century, uh, the church began to change. And out of that emerged the Catholic Church. And for many centuries, about the only church that existed was the Catholic Church. It existed in two groups. There was the Roman Catholic Church in Rome, 
Then there was the Eastern or Orthodox Church, which had its headquarters in Constantinople. Uh, then there was a young monk named Martin Luther who stirred things up, and we had the Protestant Reformation. And this brought all kinds of churches into being. The Lutherans and the Reformed Church in Europe. In England, King Henry couldn't get the divorce he wanted from the Pope, so he started his own church, the Church of England, the Episcopal Church in the United States. John and Charles Wesley, they started the Methodist Church. People that used to be called the Anabaptists became simply the Baptist Church. Uh, and these kind of kept dividing until you know, we had a lot of divisive denominations in the United States. It was in the early 1800s in America that some ministers, mostly, in fact, almost all Presbyterian, looked at this division and said, this is not right. Christ prayed that the, we might be one. So these men, Thomas and Alexander Campbell, were leaders in Pennsylvania. Barton W. Stone was one of the leaders down in Lexington, Kentucky. Interestingly enough, they didn't know each other at that time. They came to this understanding independently and then discovered each other. And if you will go to Lexington, Kentucky, you will see a monument there along the street. And that is a place supposedly where Alexander Campbell and Barton W. Stone shook hands and the two movements reunited. And this became the Restoration Movement. Uh, their idea was if we could just get back of the denominations, if we could just get back of the Catholicism and go back to the Church of the New Testament, that the church could be united. Said we need to restore the Church of the New Testament. And this movement became the Restoration Movement because they were restoring the church. Historians call it the Stone Campbell Movement uh, because Barton W. Stone and Alexander Campbell and his father uh, were the primary ones who initiated this. It has been also called the American Reformation. And this became, by the way, the fastest growing religious movement in America. Whole congregations decided that they would no longer be Presbyterian or Methodist or Baptist and would be simply Christians. Um, I like some of the ideas, some of the principles that came out of that restoration movement. I like the fact that we're not a denomination. That we have no headquarters. We have no denominational officials. All of our churches are uh, our fellowship, and that's what it is. We're not a denomination. All churches in this fellowship, we're, we're free and independent. You can be thankful that when you come to make a decision about the new minister for your church, there will be no hierarchy advising you or telling you you can or cannot use that person. I'm thankful that our churches are free and independent uh, to make their own decisions. Uh, there were some ideas that came out of that that were great ideas, such as no book but the Bible, no creed but Christ. Uh, where the Bible speaks, we speak. Where the Bible is silent, we're silent. In a sense, was unity. In opinions, liberty. In all things, love. Uh, we like to say that we are Christians only. We're not Presbyterian Christians or Catholic Christians or Methodist Christians or Baptist Christians. We're content simply to be Christians. But we realize we're not the only Christians. We recognize that there are many outside our fellowship that love Christ and serve him effectively. We try to do as much as we can the things that they did in the New Testament church. And that's why we baptize by immersion. That's the way Jesus was baptized in the River Jordan. In fact, the word from which we get the word baptize in Greek means to dip or to plunge or to immerse. So because we're trying to do things as they did in New Testament times, uh, we ask people to be baptized by immersion if they are to be a part of the church. And we observe communion weekly because we read in the book of Acts that the church met on the first day of the week to break bread, referring to the communion service. Um, I find it exciting that in the 1990s, 
Christian churches were the fastest growing religious group in America, except for one other. Fastest growing were the Mormons, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but independent Christian churches like this congregation and like Academy Christian where I attend were the second fastest growing in the 1990 decade. Um, they tell us also that we have more mega churches for the size of our church movement uh, than in any other religious group. Do you realize that we have more than 50 churches that have an average attendance of over 2,000 on Sunday? And we have some humongous churches. Southeast Christian Church in Louisville has 25,000 people present on a Sunday in about three different locations. Christ Church in the Valley, another Christian church, in Peoria, Arizona, runs 28,000 now in eight different locations. And by the way, the newest thing in church operation is multi-site, in which a congregation, one congregation, may be meeting in several different sites. Academy just entered into this. We um, heard of problems declining the central Christian church in Colorado Springs, which was kind of the mother church of all the churches of Col Christian churches of Colorado Springs. But they had fallen on some hard times and the congregation was down to about 40 people. So the elders came to us and said, would you take over this church? We'll give you the deed to the property. And you, can you take it over? And can you revive it? We've been talking about Moldesite, beginning to meet in other areas as well as in our uh, present building. So uh, we welcome this. We have invested $700,000 in re renovating that building and bringing it up to date. We have hired a campus minister for that campus. We call it the West Side Campus of Academy Christian Church. The, other church, the main congregation, though we don't like to call it that, is the Northside Christian Church, the Northside campus of Academy Christian Church. Um, unfortunately, just at the time we were getting all this done, uh, the coronavirus struck, and so we've been kind of put on hold, but we're looking forward to the time that we can begin again. Already the church was up to about 150 in attendance. So we think we're going to have a strong church there, and it will all be led by the elders of Academy Christian, and each of these will be Academy Christian West Side and Academy Christian North Side. This is the big thing now. Many churches are going to multi-site, and it seems to work. These new satellites that they established that seem to grow remarkably. I'm glad that God is blessing this fellowship of which we are part. We do cooperate. It's all voluntary. Uh, we support Christian universities. Uh, we support Bible colleges. Uh, our Christian churches have an enormous mission program. We don't get an official count because we don't have any officials to count. But uh, I would judge that we have between 1,500 and 2,000 missionaries serving all around the world. I um, love the Christian church. And last of all, I want to say I love the local church, wherever it may be. I, I wish all of you could hear Bill Hybel's video called Building an Acts Two Church. Now, I have to say, unfortunately, uh, Mr. Hybels has had a personal problem. He was a minister of the great Willow Creek Church in Illinois, one of the great churches of America. He's no longer there because of personal problems. Uh, but this is one of the best sermons on the church that I have ever heard. Building an Acts 2 church, he calls it. And he says, the local church is the hope of the world. He said, it's either us or it's lights out. He says, apart from Christ and his bride, the church, 
we're done. And why is that true? He says it's because the church has been entrusted with the message of, trans of the transforming love of God. And he says if the world is ever going to be saved, we, the people in local churches, are going to have to be the ones that will do it. Now he admits that the church is not perfect, uh, but he declares again and again, there is nothing like the local church when the local church is working right. So the local church is at the very center of God's plan for the redemption of the world. That's why it is so important. Smaller churches like your church here at Albert, uh, medium-sized churches like Academy Christian, large churches like Southeast or Southland in Lexington or Christ Church in the Valley, uh, they're all important because we have been entrusted with an enormous responsibility and that is taking the message of Christ to all the world. There's an old story that's not biblical, but it rings of truth of some who came to Jesus realizing that perhaps he was soon going to leave and they knew that he was entrusting the ministry of the church to his followers. And in concern they said, but suppose they do not follow through. Suppose they do not achieve your purpose. Is there another plan? And Christ's answer said, there is no other plan. So this is our responsibility, to be witnesses for Christ in this world, wherever we may be. In a metropolitan area like Colorado Springs, which now, would you believe, has a population of 600,000, or in a community like this, which I hear has a population of about 120. Every church is precious to God. So my message to you today would be, love your church and give it your very best. And because you see, Christ loves the church and you should too. Thank you, Father, for giving us the church. Thank you for all that it means in our lives. And help us that we may be faithful in carrying out that commission that you have given to us to go into all the world and preach the gospel, baptizing people, bringing to them the message of life, eternal and everlasting through Jesus Christ our Lord. Thank you, Father, for the Elbert Christian Church. I pray your blessing upon this congregation pray that you will lead and guide as they seek a new minister. Pray that you will help them that they might continue to represent you in this community as a part of the church that Jesus Christ established. For we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. But I don't know you folks. Some of you I've known. So I don't know how many of you are members of the church, probably all of you are. Uh, but always, we like to give an invitation because if there's anyone who needs to come and find the fellowship that is in the church and the grace of God that is available because of Christ's death upon the cross, we like to give that invitation. So as we sing this invitation song, if you have a decision to make, I'll be down in front or where one of the elders will be, and we invite you to come and make a decision for Christ. Let's join in singing this hymn.